But of course, lots of people are going back and finding they no longer have a home. Um, the, um, according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, uh, 34 health facilities, including eight hospitals, and the rest primary health care facilities, were damaged or destroyed in direct or indirect shelling. Um, two of the hospitals were not functioning at all as of Tuesday. Um, in terms of uh, electricity, uh, again, this is of yes, as of yesterday. Uh, Forty percent of the population. Forty percent of 1.5 million people uh, remained without any electricity. Uh, the remaining 60 percent received it only on an intermittent, only intermittent supplies of it. Very limited uh, uh, hours per day, or sometimes limited numbers of hours every couple of days. Um, and if any of you have been to Gaza, uh, you know that electricity just doesn't mean, you know, plugging in your toaster uh, or your television set. I mean, electricity is vital uh, for access to water, especially clean water. Um, the wells, I mean, it's mo most water, well, I think virtually all water in Gaza is provided by, uh, from wells. Uh, getting that water up to the surface uh, in most places, in most of those wells, requires power. Uh, many Gazans live in multi-story buildings. Getting that water from the ground floor to, you know, the fourth floor or even the second floor requires power. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't have electricity, and if your generator is broken down for lack of a spare part or for lack of fuel, um, you are really, uh, you're, you're really stuck. So when we talk about electricity, we're really we're talking about water, we're talking about refrigeration, we're talking about food supplies. Um, as we know, food supplies have been in short supply. They were in short supply before the fighting started. Um, and, and things like cooking oil and wheat flour for, for bread and so forth were not being allowed in until, until quite recently. Um, when the attack started on December 27th, uh, it was certainly a big surprise to most Gazans. They were unprepared for this. They hadn't stocked up. Um, once the airstrike started, the ability to get out and get to a shop, assuming the shop still existed and, or was open, uh, all of that became much more difficult. And, and probably wouldn't occur to us to think that another problem has been money. Uh, first of all, there's the decreased income that comes along with this economic strangulation I was just describing before, but there's also the sheer lack of bills, of shekels, uh, which is the, the currency. I mean, dollars will do too, but shekels are the main operating currency in Gaza, and uh, there's simply a lack of them. So even if you had your ATM card and even if the ATM machine was working or the bank was open, there were no bills for for you to withdraw or to pay your salary if you were lucky enough to still have a salary. Uh, so, you know, it's, this is such a multi-tiered, multi-layered uh, uh, environment. I mean, where the, where the crisis has uh, so many overlapping and reinforcing levels. It's really, it's really quite mind-boggling. Um, the, uh, the priority needs as of uh, yesterday, according to OCHA, were opening of the crossings of the there are five or six crossings. One is Rafah, which is Egyptian-controlled, at least nominally, uh, and the rest are all over the Israel-Gaza border and therefore fully controlled by Israel. Um, those crossings, some of them um, have seen movement of goods uh, into uh, Gaza over the, certainly the period since the ceasefire, uh, but it's very controlled. Israel is still determining how much of what gets in. Um, so far, it's been things like, uh, like foodstuffs, uh, like fuel for the electric power plant and the generators and so forth. At least this is, this is the picture I have. Um, reconstruction supplies, again, for the last 19 months, none of that was getting in. Or only one component, like gravel, was getting in. But the rest of the stuff that you need to put together with gravel to actually pave a road or, you know, to make concrete and so forth wasn't getting in. Uh, that's, as far as I know, still the case. Um, spare parts for things like generators, uh, for transmit electric transmission lines, and so forth. 
um, are, uh, have, have not been allowed in up until now. Um, and the Israelis have been, the Israeli high officials have been making clear that two things. One, they intend to keep a very tight control and be, be the, the people who say when and what gets in. Uh, and number two, that they are not going to open the crossings until now. Uh, it, it had been up until De December 27, until the rocket fire stops. Uh, now that the rocket fire has stopped, or at least seems to have stopped for the la last three or four days, uh, it's until uh, Gilad Shalit, the, uh, the young corporal who had been captured by Hamas in, in June 2006, until he's released. Now, all of these, these are things that should happen. I mean, Gilad Shalit should not be continued to be held by a hostage. He should certainly be seen by the IC, the Red Cross, and so forth. Um, the rocket fire is transparent. The Palestinian rocket fire into Israeli civilian areas is clearly uh, a, a violation of the laws of war, a very serious violation of the law. It should stop. But the collective punishment that the blockade represents is also a serious violation of the laws of war and should stop. And to make them conditional, for Israel to say, we'll, we'll stop doing this unlawful thing that we're doing, uh, the blockade, once you, Hamas, stop doing the unlawful thing you're doing, uh, the rocket. And, and, you know, the shoe is then on the other foot. Hamas saying, we're not stopping the rocket fire until the blockade is lifted. So these are things that should happen. They should happen. They should happen immediately and unconditionally without reference to the, uh, the behavior of the other party. Um, <clears throat> why don't I stop there? I think I've probably gone on a little too long.